All right, let's get started. So um, thank you everybody for joining us for our uh, first uh, in our series of webinars and what we're calling the Innovative Programs and Addiction Education Series. Uh, my name is Michael Hofer. I am the Program Director of the UCSF Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. And I also have Ellen Edens here. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Ellen Edens. I'm the Associate Fellowship Director of Addiction Psychiatry at the Yale um, School of Medicine and uh, also work at the VA Connecticut healthcare system. So. Yeah, and I'm at San Francisco VA as well. And um, so this webinar series we're doing in collaboration between the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and the uh, American College of Academic Addiction Medicine. From AAAP, Ellen and I will be taking the leads. Um, and from ACAM, we feel very excited and lucky to have uh, both Jeanette Tetro and Paul Alum, who have agreed to help uh, represent addiction medicine in these um, webinars. And I'm just going to pause for a second to see if Jeanette or Paula are here to introduce themselves. Um, okay, not yet, but anyway, they'll be, I know at least Paula will be joining us later and will be helping lead these webinars going forward. And uh, these are the goals that we're trying to accomplish with these webinars. I'm not going to read all of these, but you know, essentially we uh, came up with the idea that we wanted to have a place where both addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine uh, fellowship directors could get together, exchange ideas, collaborate, and also um, really just share and disseminate um, innovative things they're doing at their uh, fellowship programs and uh, do it in a way where people um, all over the nation could kind of get access to these materials and incorporate them into their own program or adapt them as they see fit. And we thought that this would be a really nice way of doing that. So the way we're going to structure these webinars is um, we're going to, at each uh, webinar, we're going to have different leadership from different fellowships in both addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine present uh, on programs from their own fellowship programs. And that's going to change for each webinar. We're going to try to do it twice annually, sometime in the uh, fall and spring. And they're going to be one hour in length. And we're also going to be uh, recording all of these webinars so people can access them. If they can't make these in real time, they can always access them at a later time. Um, so uh, at least for myself today, uh, for this presentation, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about some programs at our fellowship, and then I'm gonna do that for maybe about 25 to 30 minutes, and then hand it over to Ellen to talk about things that uh, they're doing at Yale uh, that are really innovative. Um, I'm gonna talk about three different programs at our fellowship, and then in between each one, I'll pause, and um, people are free to please ask questions via the chat and Randy from uh, AAAP and Ellen and I will be trying to manage the chat, but also you can ask questions uh, in between each of the different programs we're talking about if you have them. Um, so uh, just briefly on our fellowship. So the, uh, the, the fellowship, I'm the program director of here at UCSF. Uh, we have three fellows per class. Our fellows spend eight months at the San Francisco VA and four months at the Kaiser outpatient substance use clinics. And they also spend a little bit of time at a private residential uh, substance use program in Sausalito. And we're also lucky here at UCSF to also have an addiction medicine fellowship. So we collaborate uh, with them on a lot of orientation activities, didactics, and increasingly uh, having our fellows in the same rotations. And I've really, really enjoyed uh, that collaboration. Our fellows really, really like um, learning from the addiction medicine fellows and vice versa. Um, Okay, so the first program I wanted to share with you guys today is an elective experience that we built at uh, our fellowship. And I, I guess I would say it's probably a stretch to, to say an elective is really innovative, um, except for when I've shared kind of the way we've structured it here at our fellowship, I've gotten pretty good feedback from other fellowship directors and just uh, not that the elective idea is, is so groundbreaking, but just the way we've structured it, people have really liked. So I thought I would just share that with everybody today. Um, and so really, what does our elective experience look like in our fellowship? It's a four month uh, experience at a half day per week. So Thursday mornings, our fellows have this time set aside. We tried to develop it almost as like a Chinese menu of options. So um, if you look at this menu, there's 88 different items you can get on one page. And we're not quite there with our fellowship yet, but we want to have like really as many different elective experiences as possible that fellows can select. Mike. Um, Mike, uh, we're yeah. all seeing slide number 13. Okay. Um, gotcha. So, um, I 
think if you go up to the top and you you put your slide on um okay. you so put you it on, been on on 13 so far yeah if you go okay. up to the top and put it on um slideshow or whatever start from uh, beginning yeah let me do this all right is that go. better yes okay all right so um I guess I'll go to the slide I'm at right now. So is, does, can you guys see the right slide? The elective yes. experience slide? Okay. All right. So um, uh, anyway, we wanted this to be a menu of options. We wanted it to be a living document. So as faculty, we had all these ideas that we thought would be good electives, but we really actually wanted our fellows to take ownership of this rotation and develop their own elective experiences. And they've done that in, in kind of very cool ways. And we also just uh, wanted to make sure we communicated to people that it's really observational. We can't uh, get them credentialed at all these different places. So really what they're doing is they're networking, they're observing, they're seeing some patients, but they're not you know, billing and uh, staffing clinics. Um, these are some of the goals of what we wanted to do, but what we really, the basic idea is we wanted our fellows to be out in the community, in the Bay Area, learning from kind of uh, seeing all the resources that we have here um, and also learning kind of different perspectives on addiction. Um, and the other things, the way we structured this is that our fellows actually create their own schedule. So it's totally their responsibility to look at the menu of options or develop their own, create the schedule, email me um, as a program director one month prior to starting the elective. And then we set a, a cutoff of, there's about 17 weeks per rotation. So we said at least 10 of those have to be in person. So that allows for some time for vacations, holidays, and also some kind of self-study um, uh, if fellows are interested. Um, and then what we do is to ensure that they're actually out there learning and, and taking part in these activities. Uh, at two months, we have them do a 15 minute presentation for myself, just kind of informally, letting me know what they've been doing on their elective. and then. At the end of the four months, we have them give a formal presentation to our entire faculty and their co-fellows about what they learned, um, what they did, and then also um, we give them an educational challenge of teaching the faculty something that they didn't already know about addiction. And that can either be really interesting services that are being um, going on in the region that are being offered or something just about uh, addiction knowledge we didn't know. Um, and that is uh, you know, a brief summary of our addictive, elective rotation. Uh, here are some of the different, um, kind of just a, a sampling of the different electives we've developed. The one on the left are ones that we came up with as faculty. And then, uh, which has been kind of cool about this process is the ones on the right are actually ones our fellows have developed. And they're often um, the ones that are kind of a lot more interesting and they've done, uh, you know, they, they've gotten their elective developed at our ketamine clinic here at the VA. There's some researchers at UCSD that do MDMA and PTSD research, and they've developed an elective there. Um, they've also been um, good at really doing, uh, getting involved with a lot of the street medicine things going on in San Francisco. So going into homeless encampments and you know prescribing low barrier buprenorphine and other things like that. So really developed some really uh, kind of neat electives. And our fellows have really given us positive feedback about um, this experience, which we started about a month, uh, well, one year ago. Um, and that is um, what I was going to say about our elective experience. I'm going to pause to see if there's anybody who had uh, questions at all um, uh, from the chat. Mike, I haven't seen any. I just, you know, made a comment that I, I just think this is a great bi-directional kind of learning experience. And besides enriching fellows, it's, um, I, I think, just the way that they bring back information so that, you know, oftentimes we just get so confined in our own little worlds uh, that I think it's fantastic. So yeah. you have a couple of Carla's asking, how do you pay the salaries for this time? And then we also have a question about prescribing buprenorphine on street medicine. How do you do okay. follow up? Great question. So um, salaries, we basically, um, with VA funding, um, we're able to have at least a half day and sometimes a day per week that they, that they can actually have that funding but go off site into the community if we make an argument that they're learning things that they couldn't potentially learn at the VA and also will benefit veterans when they come back. So that's the um, argument we've been doing for that and been able to um, um, 
make that work with the VA funding. And then the BU prescribing on street medicine is very interesting. Um, I, you know, I don't actually know how exactly they do it. They do have attendings there who are with them, but it, these kind of low barrier buprenorphine clinics in San Francisco, they even prescribe people buprenorphine with like, um, they don't even often have people's real names. People can give whatever name they want. Um, and they follow up either um, in, uh, in the encampments or they also have a street medicine drop-in clinic downtown that people can come to. And um, uh, um, yeah, and so that's, that's how they do it. Okay, uh, just in the sake of time, I'm gonna move Mike, on. Mike, Paul, Paula Lom, Lom just uh, joined us. Oh, hi Paula, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, Okay. All right. So the, the next um, experience that I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about that I think is kind of neat in our program is um, we developed the telehealth buprenorphine uh, based experience for our fellows. And this really came out of kind of there was a clinical need in our VA system and we uh, tried to figure out how we could address that but also make it educational. So and we started this uh, about six months ago. And so what had happened is that uh, we had had a uh, psychiatrist who was retiring at our Clear, Bay, uh, Clear Lake Community Clinic. So we're based in San Francisco and this uh, Clear Lake Community Clinic is about two hours in the north of San Francisco in a rural area. And there was a psychiatrist who was retiring who was the only person at that clinic with a uh, x waiver to prescribe buprenorphine, had been following about 10 patients on buprenorphine for a number of years. And uh, unfortunately, there was uh, no other provider who was willing to get an X waiver and pick up these patients. So um, we were both clinically just trying to figure out how we could keep these patients on buprenorphine and getting treatment. Um, but also at, at the same time, our fellows had been mentioning to us for a while that they were, um, as residents, getting more and more exposure to telemental health and really enjoying it. And some of their co-residents, when they graduated, were now doing full telehealth gigs, sometimes from exotic locales in really nice tropical areas. And um, our fellows were just really interested in learning more telemental health. So we try to design a system to where we can support our uh, community clinic, provide a telemental health experience for our fellows, and also doing it without kind of taxing our clinical and administrative resources, because um, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, nobody was giving us extra funding or extra FTEs or anything to uh, support this um, uh, initiative. So what did we do? Um, we basically inherited these 10 stable buprenorphine patients and put them and started running a buprenorphine medication group every four weeks up at that community clinic. And so um, what we did is we have um, our nurse from the opiate treatment program here in San Francisco, which I'm the clinic director of, drives the two hours up to Clear Lake once a month um, to help run this group. Before the group, she collects urine drug screens and then she runs the group. You can kind of see the way this picture kind of exactly how it's set up. The patients are sitting around the table um, and then myself and our addiction psychiatry fellow uh, enter the group. We're based in San Francisco and we enter the group through the monitor on the wall and help co-lead the group. Um, all buprenorphine is sent via the mail. And then if there are urgent issues um, uh, or things that we need to address in between groups, we do that either via phone calls or tel uh, telemental health appointments. Although I've been really impressed how much we've been able to really keep everything, um, almost everything uh, managed in the, in the monthly group. Um, and we've been running this group for about six months now. Um, and we started off with a cohort of stable patients, but now we've started to add, you know, patients who are, you know, not so stable. They're using heroin, they're or, um, having other issues with opioid use disorder. And we've kind of added them into the group one by one. And I've been really, um, and my fellows have been really pleased at how well they've done. You know, um, we're doing at-home inductions uh, for them. They're showing up once a month to a group and some pretty complicated patients have stabilized really well. And I think that has to do with um, really the group being so supportive and filled with stable patients that they kind of come in and they're really, the other group members really just kind of uh, attach onto them, help them exchange phone numbers. And it's been just a really, really nice model. Um, and the other thing that's been nice is we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the veterans and our fellows on the experience. Um, 
And especially the veterans, it's been nice to see the evolution of that because when we picked them up, a lot of them were stable. They had been seeing you know, somebody individually maybe every three or four months without a lot of other drug screens or structure. And so when we started, they were actually having to come in more often and provide more drug screens and a little more structure. And so at first there was some questions about, do we really need to be doing all this? Um, and almost universally, all of them have said that uh, as the months have gone by, that they really enjoy the group and really are glad that we're doing it. Um, and with that, I've, it's also been really nice to see what started off as kind of a, a basic med group. We were talking about side effects and doses and pharmacology has really developed into a pretty, uh, pretty intense process group. Um, and even at meeting once a month, people are sharing some really um, know some really important things about trauma and loved ones who have overdosed and medical issues and it's really um, uh, been really a pretty rewarding process so um, so yeah that's uh, some information about our telehealth experience um, Mike, does anybody have any we questions do have, we do have some chat questions um, Carl is asking do patients have have to consent or how do they consent when discussing their personal health information in a group setting yeah, so we just, we do kind of an education at the beginning that um, uh, we are going to try to, you know, to discuss as many things in group, but if there's ever any, um, uh, da, 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 like, if there's ever anything that you don't want to talk about in group, we're always available, the nurse, myself, other people to talk individually. So we leave it, re leave it really up to them. And we do, along with the buprenorphine consents we have to do in the VA, we just adapted that uh, to uh, just include language about a group setting. Um, and that's how we've done that. And then do you see or make changes to buprenorphine by phone between these appointments? And are they ever seen individually for med management? Yeah, so we, um, we do make, um, uh, often we're, if we're making med changes, we do that individually, either by phone or by telehealth, but mostly by phone, quite honestly, just because it's quicker. Um, and um, if it's something like real, like in the group, we find if it's something like pretty basic and often, you know, people are like, oh, I want to go down a few milligrams. I'll just handle that in the group. But if it's something about going up or there's any kind of concerns, we'll say, okay, why don't we uh, figure out a time? We'll talk about this. And I usually say, hey, I'll give you a call after the group, you know, within the next half hour or to an hour, we'll talk about it. Um, so that's how we've been managing it. And then do they give the urine drug screens right there at the time or... How do y'all do yeah. urine drug screens? Yes, yeah, so they give the urine drug screens before. So my nurse is there, shows up about 20 minutes before the group that everybody's kind of in the lobby together and they go uh, at the CBOC and give the drug screens. And then my nurse actually brings the drug screens down to the SFBA lab and has them run here. Although there are shuttles that go multiple times a day. So she could also potentially leave them and just have it brought down on a shuttle. But um, it's a little more quick if she just brings it down herself when she drives back to San Francisco. And then Mike, one question that uh, has been asked is, could you share the consent you give to, that you've adapted for this group setting at some point? Could we share that with this group? Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. And then it also looks like there's some just questions. I, I'm Just for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of summarize some things. It's you know about buprenorphine prescribing without a live face-to-face. -face. It is mentioned that, um, you do, you know, under Ryan Hate Act, you do need to have one face to face. I think it's every 24 months is Ryan Hate. Um, in one state, they say video, uh, sorry, telephone is not uh, allowed for controlled substance, but video is. I will say that buprenorphine is a Schedule Three medication, and so you can provide refills on buprenorphine. That's not always allowed at every VA. At our VA, it isn't, but outside of the VA and nationwide, it is a Schedule Three. Um, so and can, then the other question is, in a group setting, does that push the dose up? Since they're all talking, do they tend to all be on 24 milligrams, for instance? Yeah, so these are, that's a lot of questions for me to hold in my brain and try to answer, <laughs> but they're all very good. So um, I'll just try to remember them. Sort. So yeah, I was worried that they would all just want to increase the dose or everybody would want to be on films, and that has not happened. We have patients both on tablets and films and not everybody's asking for films. We have patients who are taking four milligrams up to, uh, up to I think one patient's on 32 milligrams and there hasn't been a lot of people increase, asking more and more. And I think a lot of that is because we're not actually talking a lot about dose in the clinic and not actually, you know, in the group. Um, um, 
but it's also it just has it's something I was worried about that hasn't happened. And and, and having colleagues who run a lot of buprenorphine groups, sometimes with like 30 people in them, um, they've also expressed that not happening. So that's that's nice. Um, yes, yeah, certainly every state has different rules, and you have to kind of abide by those. Um, the VA is very nice in that we have a somewhat of an exemption from the Ryan Haight Act. Um, and uh, because we're kind of a national organization, the way it works for us, if you're in the VA system, is that if the patient has been seen by anybody, like at this Clear Lake CBOC, if they've been seen by a, a psychiatrist there, a nurse there, a healthcare provider, that meets the requirement. Um, and I don't actually have to see them uh, in person because they've been seen by one member of the VA before. So that's how we make it work here. Um, if, if you live in a state that you can't do phone appointments, then I would find a good way to very easily do Zoom or VTEL appointments with people, which are pretty, pretty readily available now to most people. Um, and I would just get around it that way. Um, we live in a, I live in a state where you can do refills of buprenorphine and just to make it as easy as possible. All the patients are on 28 day supplies. They all, I put in five re refills for each and I, all, and I refill them all together every four weeks. And so it's just, it keeps it administratively a lot easier. Um, and the one thing that is important is often if you're sending a controlled substance <clears throat> in the mail, you do need to sign for it. And for some, so for some people that means that they have to be there when the buprenorphine arrives. And if that's hard for them because of work or other things like that, they can get a PO box for about $8 a month and then have it just sent there. And then they can sign for it at the uh, post office. And so I have some patients who do that. Um, was there anything I missed there in those questions? And, I, and I'll share the consent, what we have. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, let's, uh, I'll go on quickly to the last thing I wanted to talk about today. And then I hand it over to Ellen. So uh, the final thing I wanted to share with you guys today is um, our UCSF Addiction Psychiatry Boot Camp. Uh, which we are in the process of uh, uploading on YouTube. Um, and basically the idea behind this is our faculty got together and we really wanted to, um, you know, provide, develop and provide uh, like a low barrier open source addiction education, which can be available really to anybody, uh, no matter where they are. And so um, we had developed this boot camp for our incoming addiction psychiatry fellows. And the idea behind this was really 10 lectures they receive right at the beginning of fellowship that are kind of things you need to know as an addiction psychiatry fellow because you're gonna start treating people who are struggling, struggling with substance use disorders right away. Um, and, uh, and so we developed that and, and we had been started giving really good feedback on that and, and the fellows seemed to like it. And we had faculty coming from kind of other places in UCSF to attend these lectures. So this year we decided to film these lectures. Uh, we have 10 of them, an hour each, and we've, uh, I learned how to do some video editing. Uh, these are the lectures that we have. Um, so these are the topics and also the people who um, gave each of these lectures and they're mostly addiction psychiatrists in the Bay Area. Um, and um, then those are the lectures. And anyway, uh, we've, I've edited them. I've started placing them on YouTube. There's about three or four of them up now, and the rest will be up, you know, probably by the end of the weekend. And you can go to this link right here. And if you're interested in, um, you know, doing whatever you'd like with them, there, there's there's ten lectures, so that you can. They were kind of designed for people to do all of them, but you can certainly just find ones that might be interesting to you and. Uh, you can also use them uh, with your fellows if uh, you think it would be useful. And also um, feel free to disseminate them within the academic institution you work at if you think psychiatry residents or other people would be interested in them. And we're also going to send them out like through the VA listserv and through all, all throughout UCSF and things like that. Um, and um, uh, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Any questions about this experience? Mike, anyway, you can take copy that YouTube link and put it in the chat box off yeah. your slide and put it in the chat box. That would be sure. helpful. Sure. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, yeah. And the only thing I'd say about these lectures is um, I think that they're um, you know, I think they're they're pretty educational. They're pretty good, but I would say that they're they're really they're not meant to say 
you know, we're not putting this forward as like a model curriculum. They're not peer reviewed. They're really our faculty's perspective on kind of the evidence base and what we think is important to teach our fellows. And we, you know, believe that there are many valid perspectives on how to treat addiction. And so um, this is, these are just meant to represent the way we're thinking about substance use treatment here at, at our fellowship at UCSF. And we hope that other people uh, find them useful in some way. Thanks, Mike. Yep. So if you stop sharing, then I'll start sharing. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's see if this works. Does everybody see that? I do, yeah. All I right, so it. you see the first slide here? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna actually I talk about I'm three good. different um, projects, kind of like Mike talked about three different projects. The first one is um, a, a Coursera course that Yale faculty have put together and in partnership with um, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and also partnering with ACAM and funded by SAMHSA, we're hoping to get this Coursera course out to um, various institutions across the country. And then I'm also going to talk about another SAMHSA funded um, program called REACH that's increasing underrepresented minority um, providers in substance use disorder treatment that might be of interest to your fellows, um, medical students, PA students, et cetera. <clears throat> and then last but not, le not least, I'm gonna talk about the use of simulation in addiction education. So those are the three things I'm gonna talk about. So starting with the first topic, um, addiction treatment, clinical skills for healthcare providers is the title of a Coursera course that's set to go online December 2nd, so just in a few weeks. This is a course that we've been in development here at Yale since spring of 2017 was when we started talking about it. And I'll go through a little bit more, but the bottom line is this has a, a been an interprofessional, interdisciplinary um, initiative here at Yale that encompasses four different um, programs in three different schools. Uh, and let's see. Hmm. My slideshow is not moving forward. Let me stop my share. Sorry about that. Let me try this again. Not sure why. I'm going to go here then, see if this works better. Okay, so to give you a little background on the SAMHSA grant, basically we know that there's a lot, there are a lot of curricula out there on substance use disorder education, on foundational substance use disorder education. Um, these have been created by a lot of people, probably some people on this phone call, and we're using a lot of these things locally, but it's not necessarily been disseminated. And so SAMHSA says, there's a big, huge need out there for foundational substance use disorder education. It's not reaching um, all professional schools uh, uh, systematically across the country. And we need a way to get these curriculum off the shelf and actually into the hands of the students who, who need them. And so SAMHSA said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fund 10 nonprofit organizations. That nonprofit, whichever ones that are funded, are going to have the opportunity to choose the curriculum they're going to use. And then they're going to actively facilitate the dissemination of that curriculum into 10 professional schools um, of their choosing. And so SAMHSA put out a request for propo proposals and then began funding 10 um, organizations at the end of September. September 30th is when this grant started. So the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry was one of the grant awardees. As you can see, the, the purpose of the grant really is to uh, um, increase access to foundational substance use dis disorder education across entry-level interprofessional healthcare providers. In general, you have the Association of Social Work that's really targeting social work schools. You have a pharmacy organization that's targeting pharmacy schools. You have um, physician, an APRN, a nursing um, organization that's targeting nursing schools. For the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, we took a slightly different take and really wanted to focus on interprofessional schools and interprofessional learning. And so 
Because of that, um, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry did reach out to Yale that had been working on this interprofessional Coursera course and agreed we, we are now partnering. They're going to use this curriculum and we're targeting interprofessional schools. One thing that's really been exciting is we had about nine days to recruit. All of this happened very, very quickly this summer. We needed 10 professional schools and in nine days, 34 interprofessional schools signed up to join us um, across the country. The, just highlighting that there's clearly a need um, with pharmacy schools, nursing schools, um, social work schools, um, psychology, addiction medicine, addiction psychiatry, general psychiatry, medical schools, um, and medicine um, residencies. For our particular grant, we not only wanted to do what SAMHSA was asking, which is to increase access to foundational substance use disorder education, but again, our purpose was to foster interprofessional collaborative substance use disorder education. And then last but not least, we had, an, we had another additional um, goal, which was to increase awareness of structural factors that are imp impacting substance use disorder treatment access. We really believe um, the seven faculty who worked on this course, just kind of being in, 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 in this field, we know that it's, it's not just doctor to patient. Um, that's not the only model of care, but that there are many, many structural factors that go on and, and bear weight into whether or not a person actually accesses care or not. This is a picture of our faculty. I told you that there are seven of us. Um, unfortunately, the day we videoed this, one person was quite sick with pneumonia. But you can see here that <clears throat> the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, and the School of Public Health, including the Physician Associate Program, is all partnering with the Yale Purview Center for Teaching and Learning. And so this really, the Coursera course itself could not have happened without our Teaching and Learning Center, which has a Coursera division. <clears throat> Over the course of the past two years, we've worked together to try and figure out what is foundational substance use disorder education. And we've come up with several guiding questions. So Coursera is a digital platform. Um, it's typically um, bite-sized, kind of digestible bits of information. We decided to organize things into six modules. Each module has four to six lessons, something around there. <clears throat> and each lesson is somewhere between eight to 12 minutes. Each module is guided by a particular question. So it starts out with, why should I care? Why, why is this important to your students? Um, and then how do I know if my, my patient has a substance use disorder? Those seemed pretty easy for us. Module three, though, we think is, is something that we've faced a lot. In 10 years of teaching this type of a course, it's often fairly easy to get students to where they can, diag they can screen and they can diagnose. Um, but then actually get a, accessing care. What level of care does a person need? Where do I go now? Now that I have a diagnosis, what else do I need to know in order to make, rec make recommendations? seemed to be something that we really needed to struggle with and try and get right. So that's our module three. And then module four and five really talk about foundational treatments. We talk about evidence-based treatments. We start with medications. And then second, we, start, we get, move into behavioral and psychosocial um, behave, therapies that have evidence base. And then last but not least, according to our, our goal, we, we talk about the societal factors that impact successful recovery. These are just key concepts. So I told you the guiding questions. These are the key concepts that back that up. So each module is focusing on these things. I'm not gonna read through them. I'm happy you have the slides. And if you're interested in the course um, content further, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. To dive in a little bit more into how Coursera course, uh, works, many of you probably are familiar with Coursera, but if you're not, think of it as an online university. So university professors can put their courses online um, Coursera was actually developed by Stanford, it's Stanford's platform. Um, edX is the Harvard platform, but Coursera is what Yale uses. And so I was introduced to Coursera maybe five years ago. I, I don't know, it came to my inbox and next thing I knew I was signing up for a course on the history of rock by a professor at the University of Rochester who'd written the textbook on this. So there's all kinds of courses on Coursera. It's, a, it's completely free unless you want some certificate that will cost $49, but there's no one knows how to use these certificates, but the content is all free. The assessments are all free. It's 100% online. So all of the students are gonna be able to access all of the materials, including readings, videos, quizzes, et cetera. 
um, and then they have access to this course of, for, for life. It is self-paced, so a student can go through these modules on their own schedule. Um, they're, you know, it, again, the, the programs that are going to be using this, they will decide how, what that means. So if I have a six-week course, maybe I want them to do all six modules in six weeks. If I have a two-week elective, I might want them to do all six modules in two weeks. So that you know, the entire course is about eight hours. It is, when you think about Coursera, think about it like Netflix. So somebody can go on and they can literally binge watch and be done with the entire series in a, in a day, or they can wait long periods of time and it can take you three years to finish a course and that would be fine. It's completely self-paced according to Coursera. Coursera does offer automated grading, so students will see their quiz grades immediately upon completion and then they're able to retake the quizzes. So again, the point is that they learn not necessarily to compare them or to give them an A versus a B or anything. It's, it's that they know the material by the end of the course. And then Coursera also offers this option for private discussion forums. So all of our partnering institutions will be able to have an individual or private discussion. So um, faculty can upload particular readings or comments, um, link outs to other websites, et cetera, as suits their audience and their students. Just to give you a, a timeline about what we're talking about with this particular course, we are launching on Monday, December 2nd, so that's just a couple of weeks. And then for the, our partnering institutions, we're hoping that they will start January 13th. This just gives us a couple of weeks to work out some of the kinks. But if anyone on this um, webinar is interested, as of December 2nd, you would have access to this course. Um, all of the partner champions are going to be given earlier access to um, to be able to utilize this. Now we will because we will we, we're specifically targeting these schools. We're going to be actually having like a website that these students go on to, and through this particular portal, we'll be able to access the grades and all of the um, outcomes, the participation, and the progress of the students. So that we can feed that back to the course director or the faculty member. <laughs> Each school can decide how they want to use this course. So we have three different models that we've come up with. The set it and forget it model. So just again, you have two weeks, get it done at some point, and then we will feed back the, that information to the faculty who's in charge of that, say, elective. You also could have a virtual teacher model where everybody comes together and the videos are streamed in a classroom and then you can discuss it there. And third is the flipped classroom. And I think that this is how we're gonna use it um, at Yale for our first year psychiatry residents is, you know, the, go through not module one and then come together in class and we'll talk about stigma and we'll talk about models of addiction. Um, maybe we'll do some in-class um, activity to kind of solidify that learning. And then for the next week, uh, they will do module two outside of class and then come in and discuss. Uh, but you have complete you know, how you want to use it or how a faculty member wants to use it is, is your decision. So if anybody on this call is interested in becoming a partner champion, again, we've, <clears throat> we're starting with, um, we've had 34 institutions that have been interested in this, but we do have to recruit for the second year as well. So if this is um, at all a curriculum that could be useful, we're interested in um, how useful it is. We're interested in the effect of interprofessional learning. We want to beef it up. We don't have a school of pharmacy, so we're very happy that several schools of pharmacy have collaborated with us. So we're eager to get their feedback in this first year and then help to hopefully incorporate some of their feedback. We also don't have a school of social work. So that's another area that hopefully after this first year, the course will get, will get better. Um, but that's, um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. I can't quite see the chat box. I don't know if there are any questions before I move on. Uh, so there is one question, Ellen. So one is, uh, what is the specific name of the course on Coursera so people can search for it? Yes. So it's it was the title. It was the first slide. It's called Addiction Treatment, Clinical Skills for Healthcare profess Professionals or Healthcare Providers, Healthcare Providers. So just search addiction. There aren't that many courses. There is a course on opiates out of Harvard, and there is an interesting course from Adelaide University, which is a new, in New Zealand, I think. Okay. Maybe it's in Australia. Sorry to not know my where Adelaide is. 
and you said it's addiction treatment clinical skills cl clinical skills for healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Um, great. And then um, the other thing that people have mentioned, uh, uh, Beth Howell mentioned she would like to become a partner champion. So she will will get that. Uh, that would be wonderful. We would we would love that. And and having your input would be would would, would just be great. Great. Um, Okay, I'm trying to share this again so that we can move. Oh, no, I think I moved to the beginning. Mm. Oh, I'm stuck. Here we go. All right, let me just move this. I apologize. So the next thing I want to talk about is another SAMHSA, um, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and um, American College of Academic Addiction Medicine partnership with Yale. And we are very, very excited about this. And this is not in the beginning stages anymore. We've actually started recruiting our first class. This was, um, we got this grant, Yale got this grant, not, not we, not me, but um, Jeanette Tetro and Ayana Jordan and the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry uh, got this grant a year ago. So REACH stands for Recognizing and Eliminating Disparities in Addiction Through Culturally Informed Healthcare. And the whole goal of REACH is to increase addiction workforce that's trained in culturally, culturally informed care. So there's two goals of this particular grant. One is to increase the number of addiction specialists that are adequately trained to work with underrepresented minority patients, um, but also to increase the overall number of underrepresented minority addiction specialists um, who are working in this field. So we want people who are interested in working with underrepresented minorities but we actually also want underrepresented minority represent, uh, representation in our healthcare providers. <coughs> Excuse me. Specifically, the grant is targeting addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine fellows who are seeking uh, specialty training. So each year um, over the course of this, it's a five-year grant, seven addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine fellow slots will be funded. This is up to $104,000 of funding, which is available for an underrepresented minority applicant um, who might be appropriate for your fellowship. In addition, there will be 10 total trainees um, that will also be accepted into this program that are not fellows, but might be medical students, nurse practitioner students, physician associate students, and medical residents. Psychology students and social work students are not included in this or, phar um, or pharmacy. It really is targeting medical students, nurse practitioner, PA, and medical residents. And um, travel awards are available for all accepted scholars. And I'll tell you travel to what in just a second. Our deadline is coming up, <coughs> excuse me, December 15th is the deadline for the 2020-2021 academic year. So we do encourage applying as soon as possible it's open only to US citizens, and it's only open to people who are, uh, to fellows and trainees who are un, uh, unrepresented minorities. Um, you can see here the medical director is Dr. Ayana Jordan. The co-medical director, she's an addiction psychiatrist. The co-medical director is Dr. Jeanette Tetro, who is an addiction medicine provider and fellowship director here at Yale. And the project ma manager is Daphna Paulton. And in just a second, I'll also give you information about the checklist and, and how, to, how to apply. But so you understand the program elements. <coughs> All 17 scholars will get um, one week summer intensive at Yale. And this is a full, full time, it literally goes from like eight to five, five days a week, five days for that week, teaching um, people about the, uh, culturally informed healthcare. And it's a pretty robust curriculum. Uh, and again, the first week was this past July. Throughout the course of the year, there is also direct mentorship. So each fellow is um, paired with a mentor. There are usually monthly calls just to check in, to see about career development, about issues that are going on, perhaps with the scholarly project, um, to brainstorm ideas about electives, et cetera. So there is mentorship that goes on throughout the course of the year, and all mentors have to uh, do progress reports on that mentoring. Each scholar uh, is expected to participate in some scholarly project, and this is actually a part of the application. So in advance, they need to come up with an idea about 
how they're going to provide care in an underrepresented community and what's the, their project going to be. Typically, it's a QI project. Um, but again, it could be kind of anything somebody's interested in. And then over the course of the year, there are regular check-ins and webinars, et cetera, to promote continuous quality improvement about best practices related to evidence-based culturally informed healthcare. Um, so that comes from the faculty uh, here at Yale. And actually across the country, we have advisors, uh, a, a very robust advisory board that helps with the educational initiatives. Um, again, just to iterate that the seven um, stipend fellows are actually offered a fully funded position. So one question we thought might come up, let's say, you know, we're kind of late in the year right now. What if you already have your one or two fellows um, slots already filled? Uh, and I have another person who might apply, they get funding, uh, then what? Well, you actually can apply for a temporary increase. Let's say you have two fellows and you have somebody who might be interested and gets funded. You could increase for that year up to three fellows. What you need to do is you need to talk to your local GME office. There's usually a designated official there. And then you will also have to fill out forms and apply it to the ACGME. It's apparently, I've never done it, but my fellowship director and program coordinator have, and they say it's not very onerous, um, but you do have to go through that process. And mostly what ACGME is looking for is, can you accommodate an additional fellow? Do you have the supervision? Do you have the clinical load? Um, do you have the ability to uh, provide the training for that person, adequate training uh, for an additional person? So if, any, if you know anyone, if anyone is interested in applying or if you're you know, struggling with funding for, for something, this is how you would apply. You go to this website, you download the checklist and you need to then um, download your scholarly project proposal. Once you have everything together, then you go on and you actually apply. It is, you have to apply all at one time. You can't kind of do it piecemeal. Unfortunately, it doesn't save. And applications are due December 15th. Um, this has been nice for some of our fellows because we, we have a fellow currently doing this and um, it opens up additional options. Uh, we are, we're sometimes limited because we get VA funding for a lot of our fellows and then if they want to do an elective off-site, we don't necessarily have malpractice insurance for them. People who come funded, they have their own, you know, they have their own funding so there's more flexibility and options. So it really is a nice thing. Um, for fellowship programs when, when, when we do have fellows who are able to access this. All right, any other questions before I move on? I just have a few more minutes, Mike. Anything on the checklist? I mean, anything on the chat box? Mike, is anyone there? Dr. Hofer, you're muted. Sorry. <clears throat> Mike, you're muted. Okay. Should I just move on? Yes, Mike, I don't you're see muted. any questions in the chat. There are no questions. All right. Um, we should have, I do have a flyer, a brochure, so hopefully that's. Um, put onto the, the chat box for y'all. And if you are interested, I'd be happy to send you that flyer so you have all this information. Hi, so Ellen. Hi, hey, Ellen. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Just wanted to say that uh, Paula <laughs> mentioned having a REACH fellow in her program and really enjoying uh, the one week training and feeling like it really set the tone for the rest of the year. So people who've had REACH fellows are really uh, enjoying being involved with that process. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Paula. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a great program. So last but not least, I'm gonna to turn to the use of simulations. I think a lot of people on this call are probably very familiar with simulations. It might seem like nothing new. We use OSCEs all the time. I think young trainees are, are, are very um, used to things like simulations. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but in my experience, um, simulations have been <coughs> more robustly used in addiction sorry, in emergency medicine and anesthesiology, even in internal medicine than in psychiatry. And we felt like we needed an additional way to really target um, clinical skills that were rare but very important. And perhaps we, our fellows didn't get training or didn't get enough exposure to certain clinical scenarios. 
And so we turned to simulations a couple of years ago, in particular for um, our adolescent training program. So here at the VA, um, I will say this isn't true for all programs, but our adolescent experience has been probably the weaker part of our fellowship. It's been hard to find funding for all of our fellows in places where they see a lot of adolescents. And so we really wanted to target that skill and make sure that they understood some of the issues, particularly around confidentiality and discussing treatment options for opiate use disorder um, when they're talking to an adolescent. <clears throat> and so we also are very lucky that we have Deepa Kamenge. Dr. Kamenge is an, a pediatrician and addiction specialist. Some of our fellows are able to rotate through her clinic, but there's not enough volume to accommodate all of our fellows. And so again, that's why we needed to use uh, to trial a simulation. The format for our simulation is um, Dr. Kamenge has put together an online, it's a YouTube video. It goes over state laws around confidentiality and when you would breach confidentiality and what that would look like. And so we have very clear objectives and all of the knowledge for base of those objectives are, are discussed and taught on that video. So all of our fellows watch that in advance. Then they show up to our SIM center and they are prepped. They know exactly what's expected of them. They know that they're gonna have 20 minutes. They know that these are the three objectives that we're looking for. Um, they're all usually pretty nervous, but we try and make it like this is exact. We're not looking for any more or less than just this. And um, they've already been prepped with the 10 minute video. They then go in, um, as you can see here in our SIM Center, there, it is a one way mirror. Um, faculty are on the other side of the mirror and we are observing the um, clinical interaction with the standardized patient. The standardized patients have all been prepped. They know their script, et cetera. The, um, so far, we've had mostly volunteers. We're looking for funding so we can get official actors, um, but they've done a pretty good job. While they're going through things, we have a checklist that we, we really grade them and make sure that they're hitting all of the points or noting points that are left off, um, uh, jotting down little comments about ways things are phrased, et cetera. And then afterwards, there is a debriefing that, that happens. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the check checklist and debriefing. So simulations are not merely role plays. It's not just us watching someone, you know, try, try this in, a, in kind of an unstructured way. Simulations are very structured. We have very clear objectives. We have a checklist that we go through. I don't have a picture of the checklist that we have, um, but it is something that is quite standardized. And then the debriefing guide uh, as well is actively facilitated. And so the patient, not the patient, the, the fellow leaves the room after 20 minutes, they're done with their simulation, and they actually have some time to self debrief. So they're given some space to ask themselves, how, how did that feel for me? Um, what, what went well? What was difficult? And then we actually also ask them, summarize for us what actually happened um, during the 20 minutes. And then we move into faculty debrief. So the fellow comes in, shares their insights or shares their thoughts. Uh, and we have very clear teaching points that, that we go through with fellows. We try and make it very learner driven. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the next one because we have, have expanded this to other target audiences. We started this for addiction fellows. We've also done it for child psych fellows and for pediatric emergency medicine residents. And each of these groups has different goals. And so when we debrief, we're able to hear what they're struggling with or what they do well, what their strengths are. So for instance, our child psychiatry fellows really were interested, they wanted this simulation to be in an inpatient setting. They were interested in about patients who were on benzodiazepines and how to taper um, in addition to opiates, um, how to identify opiate withdrawal. So those were some of their unique kind of needs. And we were able to tailor then this simulation for that. The pediatric emergency medicine rep, uh, residents were also very interested in naloxone distribution. And so we incorporated that into the simulation. So it's been very learner driven. And then at the end of the debrief, we actually have the fellows come up with, all right, now that you've kind of solidified this learning, what's your next step in learning? And so we have them go through that as well um, for future directions. And then 
we have two minutes left. So I'll just say that in general, our results have been good. We've now taken quite a number of fellows and residents through this simulation. And many of them are very happy with this kind of training um, and, and report improved knowledge and adolescent treatment options and when to break confidentiality and inform guardians. One of the things that reasons that I wanted to talk about simulations here, and by the way, I have to say that Dr. Gabriela Garcia, who is um, our site director here at the VA for Yale's Addiction Psychiatry Fellows, she's been really, she's the one who's created this along with Deepa Kamengay and is implementing this. Um, I would have let her do this, but she has, she's out sick today, um, but she's really been instrumental. Um, but we are, we're interested in other simulations and I thought this could be a really good forum. If you have simulations that you've already created, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, we would love to see a simulation on obstetrics, for instance, or perhaps on PrEP, um, pre-exposure pro prophylaxis, or um, dealing with HIV, or you know, any, anything that we feel like is really an important clinical skill to gain, but we don't necessarily encounter it regularly. Um, I think that would be a role for simulations. And if a group like this, if we could share, um, just share our resources, I think that that would be wonderful. So with that, 30 seconds left, any questions? So Ellen, I haven't seen any questions come through on simulations on the chat. Um, um, so I'll, I, but a lot of people just expressing thanks, and this is very informative and, and really appreciating all the kind of programs that have been sent and, and the files that we've uploaded. Um, and so I think um, uh, maybe we could, you know, one thing I was just hoping to say before we wrap up today, because uh, we're, we're almost here at 10, is that um, we really appreciate everybody for joining us today. And also, um, we are very, we are looking for people to present at future webinars. So if you are, interested um, and you have some programs at your um, fellowship that you'd be willing to present on, please let us know. Um, I think we already had somebody reach out from uh, Nick Matthews, who's in Vancouver um, and could give us kind of an international perspective on uh, education, has, has volunteered to present at a future webinar. But if anybody else is interested, please get in contact with Ellen uh, and I. I'll put our emails here. Um, on the chat and um, let us know because uh, we're going to be doing this, you know, every six months or so. Um, um, Thanks, Mike, for doing this. Say, no, yeah, I think this is a this is a great initiative. I'm excited to just hang out with addiction educators every now and again. Uh huh. Excellent. Yeah, and we'll also I'm also interested in hearing feedback from other people about. Uh, tweaking the webinar. Do we want to have one or two presenters at a time? Do we want to have more discussion? You know, we're open to all sorts of things, so we can um, uh, we can look into that. But uh, thank you all for joining us, and um, hopefully we'll we'll see you at the next one. Bye. Great.